Eventually, once you get good at what you do, you become passionate about it. The greatest breakthrough would probably be understanding what is the most important thing about scaling a business. Of course, maybe when I quit my job, I was doubting myself. If you really want to hit it big, let's say you're making multiple six figures a year, uh, you have to let go of that multiple six figure mindset. One of the things that I've noticed that a lot of people make a mistake when planning their week or their quarter is they'll have a to-do list. Welcome to another YouTube video, guys. So in today's video, I have like 20,000 cameras in front of me, so I don't know which one I'll be looking at. In today's video, I wanna do a Q&A, so if you're not following me on Instagram, please follow me right here. A few weeks ago, I asked for questions, and I'm gonna be answering them today. For those who ask questions, thank you, guys. I'm gonna be throwing up your name as I answer your question. Hades7868 asked, what other skills do you advise appointment setters to also learn to eventually create their own offer? In my opinion, if your prior skills is appointment setting, the next thing that you need to master is one, how to set appointments in a more leveraged way. So maybe go to ads or leverage better funnels, right? So if you're used to doing outbound prospecting like I used to, then you need to move to maybe leveraging funnels with meta ads and then set with calling the leads instead of setting on uh, social media. So as an example, when I started my appointment setting agency, I went from appointment setting on Facebook, right? So I would use Facebook groups, I would use Instagram, but today the way we set appointments within the businesses that we're partnered up with or how we teach your specialist to appointment set is leveraging value funnels where we get people's information name email phone number and as soon as someone opts in we call them we say hey I noticed that you just opted in for this training where you at we find inefficiencies and if they are qualified then we will book them on a call in the following 24 to 48 hours and that's much more scalable compared to doing Alba and prospecting where you have to you know do a hundred two hundred three hundred outreach in a day and hope that you will get people interested and from those who are interested then you start uh, the conversion process technically moving to ads with funnels and dialing leads is a much more scalable acquisition mechanism than appointment setting with outbound prospecting okay so that would be my answer to you and if you want to master all these skills or you want us to come into your business and help you build this infrastructure then you can either become a growth specialist or become a growth creator and partner with us that's question number one. So this question is, can you use these same systems for e-commerce? Josie asked. I guess the sales process is a little different for e-commerce because you're selling lower ticket products, but thesis around how we scale companies can definitely be used in e-commerce. As an example, one of the case studies that I had to learn from while creating the growth thesis was from an e-commerce brand owner who built a community of people who had purchased one of the products that she had. I think she was selling like a bottle and one of the things that she had done is she had built a community around people who bought these bottles and she created a challenge around the drinking water. And what that created is it created a community around the customers, okay? So that way, people who were part of that community, whenever that brand owner released the new products, she could sell it back to this community instead of always having to invest in new acquisition and new customers. Because in e-commerce, it's really a lifetime value game. I mean, it's a margin game more so than B2B. B2B is pretty, you know, you can be really profitable off of one sale. But for e-com, it doesn't work like that. You need to find a way to scale your lifetime value in the margins by decreasing the cost to acquire customers. And that happens when you sell the same people. And the best way to do that is to build a community around the customers of the first product. That's your answer, Josie. So yeah, you can definitely apply the thesis to e-commerce. Studio Artistry asked, what do you think about holding companies with a portfolio of building, acquiring successful businesses? I believe it's an amazing lever, right? But for most people is probably not the path. You know, what Hormozzi is doing is he's building a holding company or he built, um, you know, a private equity firm. And he's, instead of selling his consulting, instead of selling his services, he's just exchanging his insights, his expertise in exchange of owning a company, right? Or of owning a piece of that company. In order for you to get there, you need to have gone through so much growth and you need to have, you have need a lot of experience right? And he has acquired that. He has acquired a team of experts around him. Therefore, 
he can do that. But for you, if you're just starting out and you're just trying to make your first 10K, 50K, 100K per month, that's probably not something that you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on acquiring the experiences, but most importantly, acquiring the talent who will help you eventually if you want to go to this partnership model who will be serving your clients. Many make the mistake to go to this partnership level while they don't have talent in their business and they end up just creating a job for themselves where they can never scale out of that position. That's my answer. VSL.io, by the way, I've been seeing your ads, so good job on you know pushing your brand out there. He asked, is it better to focus on the $10 million thing long-term or the 100K thing short-term? I mean, it depends. Where are you at? If you haven't cleared your first six figures, then you probably should focus on six figures. But eventually, if you really wanna hit it big, let's say you're making multiple six figures a year, uh, you have to let go of that multiple six figure mindset or that six figure a year mindset or even a million dollar a year mindset if you wanna to get to 10 million. The way you go from a million to five and from two, three to five million a year to eight figures and above and beyond is you need to sacrifice the mindset and the way you think that got you to where you're at, okay? So yeah, you definitely gotta focus on the next, you gotta shift your mindset if you want to get to the next level. You, it's not like you have to focus on this or you have to focus on that. It's like, no, focus on this, acquire it, acquire this level. But once you've, you're past this level, then you need to get rid of that to go acquire the next way of thinking, okay? Was there any point in your career where you doubted yourself? Iman asked, I don't know. I guess we all doubt ourselves, but I wouldn't necessarily say that there was a moment where I was like, oh my God, can I actually pull this off? Of course, maybe when I quit my job, I was doubting myself, but it's these small moments even today where I'll be doubtful because you know it happens. At, the only people who don't doubt themselves are people who never try to grow. But if you're always trying to grow and go to the next level you will always doubt yourself because this is a level that you've never visited okay so there are more lack of confidence in small moments but I wouldn't necessarily say that I doubt myself but doubt is isn't necessarily something that stops people who are trying to grow right so whether I'm doubting myself or not that won't keep me from going ahead so doubt doesn't affect me the same way that it would affect others. I act in spite of doubt. Who has been the most impactful coach yeah. you've ever had? I would say that I haven't necessarily had coaches. I've had people that I listen to, people that I've bought information products from. And I guess the best product that I've ever probably bought was from Sam Ovens. I think he had a really great product, especially when it comes to the mindset training. And I think I've said this before, but he had a really great product when it comes to learning how to think better, right? But I've had, I listen to a lot of podcasts every day, so I have a lot of different sources of knowledge and mentors that maybe are not coached to me, but that I leverage from the information they share with the world. Uh, you know, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett are good. I prefer Charlie Munger. Rest in peace to Charlie. He was a legend. And uh, a lot of people in the VC world, I listen to a lot of Knowledge Project, the podcast. I think you guys should check it out. And by the way, you should check out my podcast. It's called Natural Born Leader. I've never shouted it out on my YouTube channel, but I actually have a podcast. You should check it out. It's interesting. Favorite movie and favorite show? Vampire Diaries, favorite show. And uh, favorite movie? Friends with Benefits, that's my favorite movie. <laughs> I don't recommend you guys watch it with your team, but because I did that and it was a little weird. Yeah, those are two of my favorite products or you know, movies and shows. How does Serge plan his week? Normally, I will plan my week on Sundays. One of the things that I've noticed that a lot of people make a mistake when planning their week or their quarter is they'll have a to-do list. For me, I don't have a to-do list. I just set three goals. I set three goals for the quarter. I never go past three things. I've tried having a bunch of stuff that I have to do every single day. It never works out. So I literally break my day into three parts. In the morning where I'm creating, middle of the day, I'll have a meeting. And after, you know, in the evening, I'll probably create more content, you know, maybe a sit down like this one where I'm talking. So that's kind of like how I do it. So three things, the rule of three. Something to do in the morning, something more creative, something that you have more space to build and think about, and uh, something middle of the day, maybe have meetings. I don't have meetings every day of the week. I try to have meetings maybe two days out of the week, and every, uh, but I only have three things to focus on. Three things for that week, three things during the day, three things during a quarter, and one big goal for the month. You know, we try to do like sprints. Yeah. But I plan every single Sunday for that week, and I plan the day the day before, at night. That's how I do it. Greatest breakthrough 
about scaling businesses, Manuel asked. Well, what would I say about this? I would say that the greatest breakthrough would probably be understanding what is the most important thing about scaling a business. And I actually was about to write something earlier today about this. But from studying probably almost over 50 businesses that are all doing over a billion dollars in revenue every single year, and that have been around for over a decade, 25 years, almost 50 years, you know, even companies like McKinsey that has been around for almost 100 years one thing that I've learned is that there's really two main things to focus on if you really want to scale a business the first one is distribution any company that has crazy levels of distribution will always outperform companies with the greatest product right you can look at coca-cola right I was listening to this breakdown of the business of coca-cola and they realized that they actually didn't have the best product right everybody they did the blind test where they would get people to drink Pepsi and they would get people to drink Coca-Cola and they realized that people would always choose Pepsi once they realized this they were like you know what let's actually not even focus on improving the product what they decided to do is they started kind of almost like licensing the distribution of their products so their model is that they own partnerships with so many different stores I think they have 30 million partners who sell for them in their stores and they have crazy levels of distribution and when you think of the brand coca-cola what makes them really great is their distribution meaning if they were to buy i think they just bought body armor or uh, no not body armor but i forget the brand that they bought but they buy different you know consumer brands and those consumer brands hit crazy numbers just because Coca-Cola has really great distribution, right? The second thing is brand. Best brands are the best. They're super, you know, easy to scale. They're super sustainable. You can think of luxury brands like Louis Vuitton or Rolex or Patek Philippe. Even, um, I don't know which one I was listening, even liquor brands, like high, higher level liquor, you know, alcohol brands. Mm. They're brands that have been here for like multiple decades and they're still here printing billions of dollars, mainly because of their perceived value. They are perceived as luxury products. So um, either choose distribution or choose brand by limiting how I think a great brand that does this is Ferrari. Ferrari will literally limit how many products they sell even if they have a lot more cars to sell. So they're playing this perception game, this scarcity game of cutting supply whenever there is huge demand and creating desirability. So um, those are really two things that I've realized that if you focus on distribution, getting a big audience, big reach, or focus on being perceived as scarce, as a scarce resource, then you will be pretty successful. What is the best application for cold DM? So one of the things we've tried is we've tried a lot of application and apps for cold DMs, but none really ended up working well. So much so that when we would use these automation products, it would end up automations that still leverage someone. So as an example, maybe it sends the first DM and then you have to go through and manage it. Uh, we realized that it would actually impede on the setter's productivity. So we actually stopped using automation and we would just use you know, manual work. So no automation, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Sam asked, how could someone go about selling and build and release offer as a beginner? We've been getting a lot of people asking about selling build and release as beginners, but unfortunately you cannot really sell build and release or an infrastructure as a beginner. One, because you don't yet have the insights that allow you to know how to build a methodology and an infrastructure that solves a problem within a business. That's one. The second thing is build and release is requires a lot of labor. You need employees to be able to deliver, right? So as an example for us, when I was placing, uh, when I was building appointment setting infrastructures for businesses, I had one person to consult on the campaign structure and the strategy and the messaging. I had someone building cold email systems for them, picking the domain, warming it up, setting up everything, integrating everything. I had someone who would find the setter, who would make sure that the setters are trained, who would vet the VAs, and who would make sure to schedule a call with the client so they can be onboarded. And that same person would look at the quality of the work once the setter had been placed. And uh, the last person would review the campaign once the campaign, the client acquisition campaign had been launched. So without one, two, three, four, almost like five people, I couldn't have pulled off selling acquisition infrastructures. So if you're a beginner, how exactly are you gonna pull all of this off by yourself? 
it's just a lot better for you to just find a business, work with them as a growth specialist, do these things done for you for them, and eventually go to the agency model where you have people doing it done for you for them. So you leverage yourself out of the, of the done for you with your time, and then eventually start selling, build, and release. In growthspecialist.io, we're kind of like giving you the insights and the tools that you need to know how to do all these things. And then in GCP, we partner with you, and then we start building and selling infrastructures. KSTT212 asked, what is a growth creator? So right now you guys will start seeing me use different uh, names. So there's a growth specialist and then there is a growth creator. A growth specialist comes into a business and does the work for companies, either as a contractor, as an employee, as a partner. So you're actually doing the work. You're setting up the funnel, you're building the messaging, you're uh, doing the outreach, you're running the ads, you're uh, calling the leads, you're doing the work. A growth creator on the other hand, it's the same growth specialist but they become leveraged. They have a team, and instead of doing the work done for you in companies with an agency or by themselves, they're actually built, they built an infrastructure that builds and releases the infrastructure that they would normally need to implement in that business through done for you uh, services. So growth specialist is done for you, growth creator builds the machine and puts it into the business so the business can thrive without having to pay a retainer or for uh, money constantly, right? So that's the difference between a growth specialist and a growth creator. Geraldine asked, is it possible to scale an operation service business? I guess this is more of like, can you scale an operation offer? How can I answer this question? There are a few ways. I don't necessarily think you can scale an operation as a service, but operation as a system, you can. Let me tell you as an example. So one of the things that we do within client acquisition.io once uh, we partner with businesses is we'll notice different issues that they have. Their onboarding won't be in place. They have no project management in place. They have no CRM in place. They have no real infrastructure on the back end. One of the things that we'll do once we've solved their client acquisition problems, well then the next problem becomes their operation because operation becomes a bottleneck once you've solved client acquisition. So the way that we solve operation problem that is scalable is we have a few things. We segment operation problems into a few parts. Onboarding and I guess clarifying the fulfillment of the offer is one bottleneck operationally. The next one is talent management and talent acquisition. That's also another big bottleneck. So what I would suggest to you, if you really want to scale your offer, you'll need to centralize yourself into one or the other, right? Either onboarding clients as an offer, talent acquisition as one, and you could also have another one which is like Ascension and building Ascension models for businesses. But what I would do if I was you, I would pick one single offer and I would maybe just focus on onboarding. And you would build, you know, maybe on Airtable, uh, on funnels, you would build all of this stuff already pre-built. So every client that you can sell, you just give them the same infrastructure and they just personalize it to their offer. But it needs to be similar. There, no client should be like coming in and telling you, oh, but I want to use GHL. Oh, I want to use Airtable. Oh, I want to use Close. Oh, I want to use uh, this other Asana. I want to use ClickUp. No, 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 no. They have to follow what you tell them, what you suggest using. Because if when it becomes personalized, and that's the issue with services like operation, it's super unscalable because people build what the client wants instead of them coming in with a pre-built infrastructure, right? So. ClickUp, Airtable, and maybe one CRM. These three things, plug and play them in every single business. And once you've solved their onboarding and fulfillment uh, journey and tracking, another thing we do within our um, how we design onboarding is that we also focus a lot on collecting data from the clients. A lot of businesses, they don't actually have a, a cadence at which they collect data or even a, a CRM for information from clients. They do have a lot on prospects, but once a client becomes a client, they don't have a process or a system to collect data on wins, insights, and data from what's working for them. So that's also something that we build for ourselves or for clients. But onboarding, talent acquisition, and I would say helping businesses with Ascension it could be three different products where one person buys this, then they buy this, then they buy this. And that's how I would scale the, uh, an operation as an offer, by making it productized 
and then solving more problems over time to the same businesses. Nico, and this will be the last question, asks, do you work in something that you're passionate about or just something for money? I believe that eventually once you get good at what you do, you become passionate about it. I think that I didn't necessarily get into the game from loving the game. I got in the game because I wanted freedom. But eventually I learned to love the game because I became good at it. Most people who say they don't like what they're doing, it's either because they're still broke, meaning they never actually got paid, and two, they're actually not that good. I've never seen someone who's really good at what they do who says that they don't like it. Because you, to be great, you have to start loving what you do. Because you literally have to do work when it's not required. That's the reason why most people who have jobs never excel in their career because they're just doing it just to get paid every Thursday. But for me, like later tonight, I'll probably still be consuming content around business. When I go to the gym, I'll play a podcast around business. When I wake up tomorrow, I'm not going to say, oh, it's the holidays. Let me just go swimming. No, I'm going to wake up and be like, okay, cool. What can I think about or what can I build for my clients? So every single day I wake up with one single thing in mind, which is how can I improve my business? How can I help my clients get better results? So I do work when work is not required. And I guess, you know, so it's really from the perspective of you can start with the purpose of making money, but eventually to be part of the top 1%, you need to do it because you, because you love it, right? But you will never love it until you become good. And so you can't be good unless you love it. So it's a weird thing. I don't know which one comes first, but my advice is get paid for what you do and uh, you'll learn to love it once you become in, uh, good at it. So that's it for today, guys. Check the training below. Uh, we just released the uh, Growth Specialist program and we also are looking for a few partners who wanna start selling infrastructures. So if you wanna speak with my team, just click the link below and uh, we can change your life if you allow us to. Bye-bye.